Hello, Pewaukee School District community. Uh, this is Mike Katie, your superintendent, with a quick message. Uh, I wanted to share out um, the board approved plan for um, COVID 19 operations for the start of the 21 22 school year. So, um, this is something we had talked about in the spring that the board would uh, consider the finalized plan at the July meeting, and so that they acted on uh, on plan recommendations this past Monday night in approved these. So uh, a couple of things are gonna happen. One, I wanna walk you through the plan and share that with you uh, here on this recording, and it'll uh, certainly be available uh, on our website for review. And two, um, in doing so, I wanna talk a little bit about a survey that's gonna go out to parents in some grade levels in terms of learning environment options that you have, and, and that's gonna come out right on the heels of us deploying this. Um, and we're going to have a, a relatively brief turnaround of, of 10 days uh, to get that uh, that piece completed for anyone who uh, has interest in alternative uh, kinds of environments. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, that. So we, we know how important it is that parents have an understanding of the plan and trying to decide what you believe is best for your child and making a selection for the fall. So I'm going to share my screen and walk you through uh, the plan that we have in place. All right, what you'll see here is uh, our operational plan for the fall and it's referred to as phase four. Uh, just a little history lesson here going back to, to last year uh, we launched a multi-phase plan, uh, zero um, being uh, fully virtual. And then we had a couple of hybrid options that worked up to phase three, which was when we were fully in person uh, five days a week with students. Um, so that was a plan that served as well last year as we kind of navigated uh, the changing dynamics. Um, right now we're in great shape. We are uh, running uh, summer school effectively. I'm happy to say we uh, knock on wood to this date, we've had zero infections um, of students at, at school or of staff. Um, haven't had any need to quarantine anybody uh, so far with summer school. So that's a really, uh, really positive uh, piece. Our, the local data in terms of the community, all those things, cases are very low. Uh, so we're very encouraged to see those, uh, those uh, pieces of data. Uh, but of course, we know we have to have a plan. Uh, certainly this can be unpredictable. Uh, we know that uh, there are concerns with um, more contagious variants that uh, many of you have probably heard about in the media. Uh, so again, we're gonna take uh, necessary precautions to do everything that we can to operate schools effectively as we kind of segue to more normal operations uh, while also doing uh, taking prudent steps and really considering public health guidelines from CDC and others uh, to keep our schools as, as safe as we can. So phase four, uh, the reason it's called phase four again is simply because it builds on the other phases of the plan that we had implemented through last year. So a couple of pieces here. Uh, first of all, over to the left of uh, the page is communication and metrics. Um, I want uh, families and staff to understand that we will uh, continue to maintain dashboards with metrics. We'll be monitoring incidents of infection uh, and rates of quarantine in our school environment. Uh, we'll be continuing to monitor uh, disease burden rates in our community and in in county and state, uh, just as we did last year to help us uh, adjust and make any decisions as necessary. Um, below that, you'll see a note here on operations. Um, the board has uh, determined that authority and responsibility for the day-to-day -day, uh, operations related to this plan uh, are delegated to myself as the superintendent. Uh, we would go to the board if uh, real substantial changes to this plan need to be made, such as any kind of extended significant change to learning environment for groups of students um, uh, more than more than some kind of short-term um, uh, temporary situation uh, or uh, anything substantial that we'd feel we need to do uh, if uh, if the virus really became a uh, we had some some su substantial uh, outbreaks or something of that nature where we'd have to consider a more significant mitigation like masking requirements or something of that nature which none of us want to see but if we would have to consider something like that we would go to the board uh, to make those those decisions. Uh, the next piece I want to share is that there are some learning environment options. Um, first, I want to talk about uh, fully virtual. Um, fully virtual will, will be considered as an option in grades 5k through 6. 
uh, for the first semester. At this time, we do not anticipate considering offering um, virtual learning as an option in semester two, as we anticipate uh, that all students um, 5K and over certainly would have had an opportunity to be vaccinated at that point. Uh, the most recent information we have is that uh, students five years old and up may be eligible for a vaccination um, in September or October. So certainly by semester two, that that uh, will have been available. And we'll talk a little bit about this plan, how we view the role of vaccination. Um, we are really looking at some differences for our youngest students who do not yet have access uh, to vaccine um, versus older students in grades seven through 12 who uh, currently do have uh, access to vaccine and certainly would have had the opportunity to be fully vaccinated if that's what families had individually chosen um, for their students. And that makes a difference in terms of some of the protocols that, that we have in place. So on the heels of this communication, uh, a survey will be deployed that will include um, the opportunity for parents to select a fully virtual option in grades 5k through 6. Um, a couple of things to note and some differences uh, as compared to last year. Anyone opting into the fully virtual environment will be doing so for all of semester one. We will not um, be moving in and out of virtual environments like we did last year. Uh, we will not be doing midterm uh, changes uh, uh, into virtual from in-person or from virtual uh, to in-person. This will be something uh, folks will have to commit to on the front end so that we can staff it appropriately to make these sections. Uh, further, uh, we will require that we have um, student minimums uh, to uh, offer these sections. So I am not saying that we will for certain be offering virtual at all these grade levels. Uh, we will offer it if we have enough students um, that opt into the fully virtual environment. Uh, so we're looking at approximately 25 students to create a section to um, justify the allocation of staff um, uh, for, those, uh, for those sections. Uh, also note that what we may do uh, is use a multi-grade so, um, sections to allow those to run. So for example, we might have a five-year-old kindergarten uh, group combined with first graders. Uh, this would be the same teacher for all those students who would differentiate the curriculum between first graders and 5K, or we may see a second and third grade section or a uh, fourth grade and fifth grade section. And we would not have the ability to combine students to um, include sixth graders because the schedules are, are vastly different between Asa Clark and, and the elementary schools. So. Uh, perhaps there would be multi-grade um, sections and parents should be aware of that uh, when indicating uh, what you want for your student when you sign up, uh, that it may be a multi-grade selection. And I, again, I really do want to emphasize that when the survey comes out, that is when uh, families are making their commitment in terms of uh, that environment, if that's what uh, is desired. The other piece that will be um, uh, assessing with the survey is in relation to uh, masking as an option, as an opt-in, as a purely voluntary um, opportunity, because we have heard from multiple families who are interested in having their students in person, but are very concerned about uh, infection for younger kids who have not had the opportunity to be vaccinated. And so we will ask a question to see if there are substantial numbers that could create sections of students who intend to wear masks to school until they can have access to vaccine. And so kind of similar to the fully virtual, if we have enough students and families, we could look at um, in-person sections. Again, that is purely voluntary, that is opt-in. Otherwise, these environments will be masking optional. So I wanna make sure that, that that is clear. So 4K parents will also get a survey um, if that is something that you're interested in, that's purely about any interest or assessing any interest that, that may exist for having masked uh, sections, if that's what uh, a family believes is in the best interest of their children. So really just trying to provide um, choice and voice uh, to, to families as we continue to work our way through this and, and allowing you to determine what you think is in your child's best interest. So we'll see what the numbers are on that, if we can offer that, again, much like virtual. 
Uh, emergency remote learning is something that was in place last year and will be again this year. Um, we will continue to do some level of contact tracing. There may certainly be some level of quarantine for students. Certainly any student that is positive for COVID-19 would have to complete quarantine. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the details on contact tracing uh, next, but um, for any students that are in quarantine, we would be providing that emergency remote learning. Uh, temporary virtual learning. Um, again, something that we did last year. Uh, if we have situations in a classroom or a house or a grade level or a school in which um, rates of infection uh, spike, uh, it may be necessary for us to uh, place uh, groups into temporary virtual learning like we did last year. Again, we hope that that is not necessary this year. And, and again, things currently look really good, um, but we do need to be prepared uh, to respond if, if we have some kind of spike in, in infections in cases. Um, and so if that was the case, like we did last year, we would uh, provide instruction virtually until we could return those groups of students to school. So that really covers the learning environment piece. Uh, the survey will be following this communication. So watch for that. Uh, for, again, for parents of 4K through sixth grade students um, uh, in your email, uh, we will not be offering um, those kinds of learning environments seventh grade or older uh, because all of those students will have had the opportunity to be vaccinated. So families have choices if, in terms of providing for the safety of your child. And so we are treating those environments differently than we are with those youngest, younger grade levels. Uh, just a quick note, sanitation and hygiene uh, and ventilation practices that were in place last year remain. That includes enhanced sanitation, cleaning high touch surfaces, availability of hand sanitizer, emphasis on hand washing. Um, we've communicated that last year, the district invested in bipolar ionization, uh, HVAC systems, which are much like what hospitals use. Um, they improve air quality, they help uh, destroy uh, any airborne viruses. Uh, so those continue to be uh, in place and there will be um, increased um, uh, ventilation with outdoor air uh, in terms of just how we operate our systems uh, as a, an important protocol. All right, further additional mitigation uh, protocols that are in place, just kind of a variety of things. I mentioned vaccination earlier. I wanna make sure it's very clear that the district is not going to uh, pursue vaccination as a requirement for any students or for staff. Uh, we believe that is a personal choice. Um, so I uh, wanna make that clear. Uh, vaccination is not something that we are, we are going to be requiring. Um, so what do we do with students who have viral symptoms? Um, students who would be presenting with viral sy symptoms will be asked to wear a face covering until they can leave the building and be picked up. So this goes to our health room uh, environments. Uh, we had uh, in place last year where students that presented with viral uh, symptoms and were placed in isolation until they could be uh, picked up and brought home. So really the exact same practice as we had last year with students going to the health room with viral symptoms um, will remain in place. Um, and then a third note, and this is something that we probably haven't emphasized enough, is how important it is for all students and staff uh, to maintain optimal health through proper nutrition, uh, nutrition exercise, and rest. All of these things support healthy immune function. Um, so again, just a, a note uh, that we really encourage kind of that self-care to put our, ourselves in the best position to, to deal with any kind of illness if, if that were to happen. All right, so some of the details on symptom monitoring and contact tracing. So we will maintain a really an, an enhanced vigilance of, of symptom monitoring um, for students and staff. So uh, hugely important, as we emphasized last year, that individuals with viral symptoms uh, stay home and all uh, individuals with viral symptoms, uh, in particular, any respiratory illness, fever, that kind of thing, get tested uh, before returning to school if symptomatic. Um, at a minimum, students and staff should be symptom-free uh, and have no fever, vomiting, that kind of thing, unmedicated, 
for a minimum of 24 hours before returning to school. And this is true regardless of any kind of vaccination status. Anybody with, a viral, with viral symptoms uh, should be out unless they've been symptom free. Uh, this is in fact the policy that was in place pre-COVID uh, for how we manage uh, really kind of any illness. Uh, a note about the testing. Uh, we are working in partnership with DHS, Department of Health Services, uh, DPI. They have a program in which testing can be offered at free of charge uh, at schools. This again is purely a service uh, that would be voluntary. Uh, certainly no student would ever be tested unless that would be requested by a parent. Um, but there uh, will be uh, on-site testing uh, services available uh, for students and staff uh, to avail themselves of as a service. Uh, contact tracing, let's talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> so contact tracing is the process by which um, if we have an identified positive case uh, who was at school, um, then we uh, go to work identifying who uh, would meet that definition of a close contact, which I think we're all familiar at this point was within six feet for 15 minutes or more. Uh, anybody in that situation would be considered a close contact. So that would continue to take place, um, uh, but there are some differences and we did um, implement these to some extent at the end of last year, which greatly reduced the number of individuals in quarantine. Uh, so parents will be certainly notified if your student is identified as a close contact to someone who was positive. Uh, you would be at a minimum provided with information regarding CDC and county health recommendations in terms of how you uh, are recommended to handle that situation. Um, the change that uh, we began to implement at the end of last year that would continue this year is that non-symptomatic close contacts would not be required to complete quarantine. Um, however, if um, the family desired to have their student uh, quarantine, the district would certainly support that and um, uh, emergency remote learning would be provided. Uh, those absences would be excused if that's something that the family chose for themselves, but it would not be required for a non-symptomatic close contact to quarantine. Uh, students who are positive for COVID-19 uh, will have to complete quarantine and students who are probable for COVID-19 uh, would have to complete quarantine. And, and probable again is defined as someone who's a close contact who is also uh, presenting with symptoms. So those students would have to complete a seven day minimum quarantine uh, with a negative test or a full 10 day quarantine before returning to school. Uh, fully vaccinated students or staff who present with viral symptoms uh, who may have had an exposure uh, would have to, would be encouraged to, to get tested um, uh, and may return to school once they are symptom free for 24 hours. So uh, there is a, a difference there for individuals who are vaccinated uh, who would not have to complete that full quarantine in those situations. Hopefully that all makes sense. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about differences between um, grades 4K through six and seven through 12. Again, the reason for any differences is because um, all students in grades seven through 12 uh, have had full access to vaccination. Um, so that changes um, things a little bit for that environment. Um, so you won't see some, these additional, uh, some of these additional protocols in place um, at the middle and the high school or at seventh grade through, uh, through 12th grade. 4K through six, um, until uh, these environments would meet that definition of full access to vaccination, which is equal to or greater than two months uh, after the initial um, eligibility date for vaccination. So um, everything on the left here for 4K through six would likely transition to um, the removal of some of these pieces like cohorting and social distancing once um, we are two months past eligibility date for those students. So until that happens, uh, there will be some cohorting strategies in place. We did this last year uh, pretty extensively. Uh, but there will be some modification to schedules that will reduce that interaction of different groups of students uh, so that uh, might mean students are a little bit more isolated to their classroom um, up here only or uh, perhaps a house like we have in sixth grade at the middle school or, you know, some groups of classrooms. Uh, there, you know, we'd be avoiding things like um, 
uh, assemblies with multiple classrooms, those, those kinds of things. So cohorting is a strategy that's used to reduce the interaction of, of larger groups of students because that can prevent a more significant spread. If you think about the concept of quarantine, if we have one positive student, but they're isolated to maybe just their classroom, as opposed to being exposed to many different groups of students, it uh, significantly reduces the potential for spread of virus from that infected individual. So again, a practice that we used all the time last year. Uh, social distancing strategies that will be implemented to create um, again, greater social distance between students when outside of their cohorts indoors. Um, this is something that will be primarily related to lunch in the cafeteria where uh, the schools will do their best to try to create a minimum of three feet of distance uh, between students. So there might be some seating charts so that they could contact trace a little bit more easily, but there'll be some social distancing practices in place there. Whereas in 712, um, uh, there won't be uh, much of those kinds of things happening. All right, face covering and masking. Uh, the wearing of face covering or mask is optional indoors and outdoors for students, staff, and visitors. Um, we have a note here that if we do experience abrupt or sustained increase in incidence of infection in the community and or within our schools, that may result in the district changing the advisory status from optional to recommended, again, which is um, just a stronger encouragement or recommendation uh, for the use of face coverings as a mitigation strategy. Uh, anything beyond a recommended, which is still not a required uh, situation, uh, would be something we would go to the board for before we would make any more significant changes. Um, please note that currently the federal government requires uh, the wearing of masks on school buses. That is not something that we um, can change. We can't overrule the federal government. Um, so there currently is a mandate uh, for wearing face coverings on buses. If the federal mandate is removed, um, then the expectation on buses uh, for the school district would simply be aligned with whatever we have in place for indoor environments in our schools, which currently is uh, masks optional. And this is something I really wanna stress um, that we, we really need the support of all parents uh, to reinforce with students that individual family choices with the use of face coverings is to be respected and that harassment or bullying related to these choices will absolutely not be tolerated. I've heard this from um, numerous parents about concerns about bullying and harassment and I, I've heard it from both sides of the equation. Parents who intend their students to uh, wear masks at school are concerned that their child is going to be teased or harassed for wearing the mask and I've heard on the other side, um, parents express concern that if their child doesn't wear a mask and others do, that they're going to experience some form of, of harassment. And we just really need to come together as a community and as a school system to communicate consistent messages to our kids that that is uh, inappropriate. Uh, these are individual choices people are making for themselves. Um, and uh, once again, there will be discipline uh, issued. We will not tolerate harassment or bullying related to these issues. And we strongly request that parents support us uh, in that conveying that message to your kids as we get to school. And then lastly in the document is simply a link to the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, they have updated guidance in relation to schools uh, and practices and uh, the link there will take you to that. Um, and that's certainly something that we have and continue to reference as we put our plans together and determine how we're, we're going to, to function. So with that, um, I wanna thank you for your time. Uh, this is probably a little longer than I wanted to be, but I wanted to make sure we provided some explanation in terms of the plan. You can always reach out if you have questions. Uh, we certainly know how important it is that parents have this information as you can think about the fall and how you wanna do things, especially for those grade levels that will have some decisions to make regarding um, uh, learning environment choices uh, such as virtual. So uh, so parents, in, again, in those grade levels, please be watching uh, for an email with that survey so you can make your determination for the fall. So with that, we hope everybody has a great week and weekend and appreciate uh, your time.